down the hammer and pick up the pencil. You're about to listen to the Savvy Radio Show. Learn from real life real estate investors. Experience revealed with the Savvy Landlord as your right, host. So it doesn't record. Okay, we're live. One, two, three. All right, everybody, welcome to the Landlord Lunch. Um, Stephen is out and about with his family this week. Or, yeah, this week takes his fall break for some school. So um, we've got a uh, very good speaker today. If I haven't caught you for your $10, I'll catch you in a minute. Um, Jackie's going to talk to us a little bit about, I think, the new landlord uh, it's, it's stuff. It's 101 tips for landlords. Oh, 101 Don't tips, man. Anybody. So, <laughs> so let me see if we do a tip a minute. We're going to be here a little while. But anyways, it uh, should be good. She's real knowledgeable. She has. She's done real estate, too, and has some properties and done a lot of things. Um, she's very knowledgeable in all the little things we talk about and deal in and, and definitely has some do's and don'ts that we've already talked about a little bit before we got started here today. So I'll just give her a lot of time. Since we have 101 to get through, we're going to do like <laughs> half a minute, and we'll see how it goes today. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll turn it over to you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for being here, everybody. And I'll tell you what, Oklahoma weather, I always say fall is my favorite day of the year. So <laughs> enjoy. This is, I think this is the one day. For a mere $10, you're going to get whole bunch of information. I call this the one hour law degree. And I put pins at every one of the stations because I I'm bad about forgetting my pin. So there's no excuse for not taking notes. You know, <laughs> that's perfect, right? I'll train you. <laughs> okay, that's I'm perfect. Like such a diva. <laughs> Do you remember the last uh lunch that we had here I think and Stephen asked the question is it possible to make your business run without you? I say, yes. It's called a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> and people will say, well, you're a lawyer. Why do divorces cost so much? And I say, because they're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but seriously, we're all landlords here. This is landlord luncheon, which means, just by definition, I guess, that we're all investors. And there's a lot of things you need to know as an investor. So you'll make the best possible deal and, and not make a bunch of mistakes that, that uh, investors typically make. And I have a lot of handouts here to get through, so we're going to go pretty quickly. I'm going to hopefully have time for one or two great questions. Come, you might have to sit. There's a blank. There's a blank. I'll try to maybe just take them in the order they're, they're here. First handout, quiet title lawsuits. How many of you have had familiarity with the quiet title lawsuit? You have, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want one for me now? That's right. <laughs> so I want to ask Andrew. Where are you, Andrew? Here we go. When do you have to do a quiet title lawsuit? Whenever the title company tells you. That's the correct <laughs> answer. <laughs> What has been your experience with quiet titles, Andrew? Do what? What has been your experience with quiet titles? And they take too long. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also correct. <laughs> a quiet title means there are clouds on the title. And if you look at your handout, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong with the title. There can be there can be clouds on there, such as liens. There can be judgments. There can be stray deeds. There can be all kinds of things that happen to the title. And when you buy a piece of property, of course, you want the best marketable title because someday you're going to want to sell it mm -hmm. or your heirs will want to sell a property and it needs to be a clean chain of title. So typically when we do a quiet title, in the best scenario, it could happen in about 45 days. Is that, the, is that typical? <laughs> Dan? <laughs> Things can go wrong because even when the one that uh, that I'm most recently familiar with, there's IRS liens, there can be Oklahoma state tax liens, and those don't go away when you buy at the annual tax sale or the sheriff's sale. And dealing with that can take some time. So I'm saying the best case scenario would be 45 days. The worst case could be three years. Yeah, I just finished one. They took three years. It was hotly contested. Went to trial. Went up on appeal. 
came back down with you know it was firmed it came back down then we had all this post trial about attorney fees and uh, all this other stuff uh, my bill I was kind to him was only fifteen thousand dollars so be careful when I when you go to these auctions and you buy stuff you might be buying a big lawsuit unfortunately and uh, oh okay here's the deal here's the little list if you go to the annual tax sale, you will have to do a quiet title action. So factor that into price when you go to do your bids. The sheriff sale, a lot of times you do not have to do it because what happens? The junior liens go away, right? Typically the mortgage company, they're the ones that takes it through the foreclosure. The sheriff sale that happens every two weeks, it gets sold. But now just because the junior liens go away doesn't mean the tax liens go away. So you really need to do some research or have your attorney, have your realtor, have somebody competent to look at the properties you plan to bid on. Now I will say this, if you go to the sheriff's sale, you can get out of it. If you do it very much, they won't let you bid anymore. You can change your mind. The annual tax sale, you cannot. They will sue you, they will make you close, they will get the money out of you one way or other. They are very, very strict on that. Uh, this one guy bought it. He had this, uh, you know, last minute idea of like, oh, well, why that nobody's bidding? It's, oh, I got this house so cheap for fifteen thousand, and he went over. It's just a crummy lot. There was no house on it, and he he didn't he wanted to get out of it. And they said uh, he said he relied on the picture on the county assessor's site. It was a couple of years old. Well, the house had been torn down then, since then. So <laughs> don't don't bid on stuff unless you've at least driven by. And the other thing about that is you can't get in them, so you don't know what you're buying necessarily. There could be people living in the house that might have better title than you, actually. They might have better title than you, even if you paid cash at the sheriff's sale. It's because adverse possession is for real in Oklahoma. And if they live in that property for 15 years, uncontested, they could probably get clear title. You have... Uh, just all kinds of things that happen. I look, I'm not going to read them all to you, but you can read this on your own. Things that can happen. Oh, here's one little nugget for y'all. If you see mechanics lien, say ten thousand dollars for a roof, you go, oh, damn, ten thousand. That's going to wreck my whole deal. If it's over a year old, it's a nullity because in Oklahoma you cannot renew the mechanics liens after one year. So that's a pretty big deal. And the cost, like I say, the cost can be anywhere from fifteen hundred to fifteen thousand. There's really no upper end, as far as I know. Okay, I'll give you kind of in the notes section. There's kind of an overview of how the how the quiet title proceeds. And when you get your final order, you got to make sure the attorney or the title company or you take that judge's order to the second floor of the county courthouse and file it with the county clerk. Because that is, in effect, your deed. It puts it in your name, and then you can do whatever. Now, just a little note of clarification here, because recently a very experienced investor told me he didn't know the difference between the county clerk and the court clerk. And this is something <laughs> investors should know. A court clerk is on the fourth floor of the courthouse at 321 Robert S. Kerr. <laughs> that's where all the legal pleadings get filed. That's where the cases originate. That's where you have all your legal pleadings. The county clerk is the one that takes the deeds, the judgments, the liens, and all that kind of stuff. It gets in the chain of title. So you can't just file it with the court clerk and think you're good. You have to walk down the second floor and file a certified copy. Right, that's all I'm going to say about, unless someone has a, a burning question on quiet titles. Certified copy of what? Of the fi judge's final order. Okay. Because that is, is in effect, <clears throat> your deed. And, it's, it, it, and it pronounces right in there, free of all lien judgments. In it, yeah. Second floor? It's Second county? floor of the county courthouse. On the back of the papers, oh, yes. In your notes section, it says affidavit of military service now required. Veteran. What is that pertaining to? Veterans get special treatment in the eviction court and actually in any court. 
you have to show them that you that this person is either in or not in the military because if they're in the military you have to give them a really uh, kid glove treatment because they may be in another country to where they can't respond to this so that wouldn't be fair if they're out of the country they have to have notice okay. and what you do is you go in there's the website you go in there put in their information and it'll tell you if they are they're not or it can't be determined but at least you tell the judge I tried and I can't find out on the back of it, just so we can move on on the back this is a whole other class that I teach, is what can you find out in a property search? This is all the internet. All these things about a property. And there are several, you know, you'll have to go on several websites to amass all this information. If there's something that you find on a wholesale deal and you're really hot to buy it, uh, me, because I know how, I guess I know how, I'm extremely curious, I wanna know before I talk to the people is there a lien? Is it in foreclosure? Is it in a divorce? Is it how much do they owe? What all is going on with the property? Now, Andrew waits till he gets to the title company and they tell him. So th that's another way. But if you do volume like he does, you can't spend right, that much time looking at all the property. So other than the county associates website, what websites do you use? Uh, I use a, I use like Intellius and, and the, the, uh, the their county assister, the county clerk has gold on it. That tells you if there's child support liens or there, if, there's, if there's gone through a divorce, if it's gone through whatever, it's, it'll be on there. Everything will be on there. And the other thing that I do is I rely on the title company search or their report. I don't rely on my report, not even because I could miss something. They're the gods over the title. That's their in-house counselor, whoever they have a contract with, that reviews all these transactions. If they say this has to happen, this has to happen, this that's what Andrew said. When they say it has to happen, because they're not going to issue title insurance unless mm -hmm. they know mm -hmm. the title's clean. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. You get to pay three or four hundred dollars and they're hundred percent sure it's clean, so they'll issue you the policy. Mm -hmm. When they prove you don't need it, they'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. It's like a loan. <laughs> 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 okay, let's I think should, that kind of leads us right into the, the deeds. There's a few things you need to know about deeds, even if you never prepare one. And you might, I've done, I mean, you know, if, if it's a family bill and you want to transfer it to a family member, you might just get on the county website. There's all kinds of forms there. Lots of forms. There's the warranty deed, the quick claim deed, all these things that are mentioned on the, on the back of your handout. Did you uh, ask those out earlier? I'm um, not sure if I have. Does anybody? We ran out, I guess. Okay. Let me see if I have. Um, maybe you can uh, look on with somebody. We good. <laughs> okay. Here's what I want you to know about a deed, kind of what's important that has to be on a deed. First of all, you have to have the parties. That's kind of obvious, but some people don't know. And I've had experienced people say, I can't feel this out. I don't know who the grantor is. I don't know who the grantee is. Okay. So it, it, you need the, the grantor, which is the person selling or conveying the property away. Now this is what you need to know for sure. If you do one of these, or if you look at one of these to, to know if it's a valid, good deed, it has to have the marital status of the grantor. Mm -hmm. And see the one in your handout? It's, it's this person, some, some Smith, a single woman. If that's not on there, that can cause problems. And I tried to close on a property, and the title company paid me prove that she wasn't married. How do you, her husband had died years ago, how, how do you prove that she never got remarried? How, what we had to do is get an affidavit from her longtime attorney saying that he knew her and they went to church together and this and that and she's never gotten remarried and they go, okay, that'll, that'll be good. <laughs> it's like trying to prove the negative. It's mm -hmm. kind of hard. That's the party of the first part. Then, of course, you have to have uh, the, grant, the grantees, the ones that are taking the property. And the important thing there, you don't have to put the marital status of the grantee, but... And this is what's important. See that highlighted part down there? Mm -hmm. You're, they're taking as joint tenants, 
and not as tenants in common with the right of survivorship. That's important because what you can have is A and B as joint tenants with right of survivorship. Or you can have A and B, nothing. What happens here when, when A dies? What happens here? B gets, B, gets B gets it. What happens here when A dies? Probate. 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 It goes down. It doesn't go over. It goes down. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that ma magic language in there, you know you're looking at a probate. Difference between joint tenancy and tenants in common? Yeah. They say they're confused because it's kind of sound alike. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the joint tenants. Mm -hmm. And to be absolutely clear, they usually put that language, and not is tenants in common. What's the difference? It, this is tenants in common. It's basically that language mm. that creates this survivorship to where it goes to him. Mm. I had one case that was a probate, and these stray kids kept showing up, and they kept saying they were entitled, and they just kept making some crazy argument. Well, what happened was, they had the, the husband and wife, it was the second marriage, she died, okay, it went to him, and then when he died, it went down to these kids. And these kids were mad because they thought they should get something. But see, that's operation of law, it doesn't happen that way. It goes that way. So that they showed, they eventually, they were very mad. <laughs> is, that the, is that the same in every state? It's pretty much the same. Other states have, um, what do they call that, um, a different way. When a husband and wife take property jointly, in other states, it's, um, what is it? there's a term for it. And uh, so they, they you can do it this way or the other way. But it's pretty much the same <coughs> in the state. But other states do have some slightly different requirements. I'll tell you that one. Okay, so what you also have to have is a fantastic, accurate description of the property. Sometimes people put also known as, they put the address. The address and the legal damn sure better match. And the legal description better be completely accurate to the spelling of the addition. Because I had, a, I was dealing with the wrong lady on, or the wrong person on a property one to buy. And it didn't get put in the, in the right girl's name because she left an S off the addition. And I told her about it. She went up there and changed it and then of course she wouldn't sell me the property. <laughs> So th these have to be at just double, triple check your legals. And then down here I've got highlighted to have and to hold. That's the conveyance, that's the habendum clause, that's telling you what I'm giving you, right, for how long. So it's usually all this, it could say surface only, could say surface and minerals, whatever. But this to have and to hold, that language has to be in there. It has to be dated. It has to be signed by the grantor only. Hmm. The grantees never sign. If they do, it's just superfluous. But it has to be signed by the grantor. And in Oklahoma, by statute, the grantor's name must be notarized. Acknowledged, notarized, verified. <coughs> I don't even think they'll, they'll file it if you don't have that on there. Now, let's, let's turn our paper over because there's a couple of things I just want to mention about some different types of deeds. The warranty deed, special, quit claim. What's the very best deed you can get? Warranty. warranty. Well, what about special warranty deed? Would that be even better because it's special? <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> the special like warranty deed, and, and Joanne told me she got one of these one time from my auction. The warranty special is only saying, I warrant that during the period I had it, I didn't do anything to screw it up. Mm -hmm. Anything before Thursday? Uh, no. A quick claim deed, everybody knows that, right? What a quick, quick claim deed is. Are you necessarily giving anything in a quick claim? Could be zero, right? You could quick claim the Golden Gate Bridge, correct? <laughs> <laughs> giving all your interest. You're giving whatever you have, that's what you're conveying. No warranties, no guarantees. You're just like, satisfy yourself. Huh. Um, I've also listed a transfer on death deed. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that later under probates. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, um, does your title insurance and stuff transfer if you quit claims? Uh, no. Okay. What was the question? 
if they do a quick claim, your prior title insurance won't cover it because they don't know what you've done during the time that you had it. If you, um, there's a, there's, these are just different kinds of deeds that I've seen. There might be other ones. There's the sheriff's deed. Now, how's the sheriff's deed different than the county deed? The county deed, and this is what I believe, is the properties that do not sell at the sheriff's sale, that is the annual tax sale, the county then owns them. This is the annual tax sale, which is lack of paying property tax. They go to, to the annual tax sale. And those properties that don't sell are then owned by the county, and they're free to sell them, and they issue a county deed. No, so if how they, do you get a warranty deed on it, or can you? No, you have to go through quiet title if you want to get absolutely perfect. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, of course, I prepare these all the time. It's personal representative deeds. That's what comes out of them within a probate. Hmm. Now, after the probate's completed and the heirs have it in their name, they just do a regular deed. And then I've also seen yeah, a deed in lieu of foreclosure. That's that's the main ones. Okay, we need to move on. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I think Luke wanted to see that. I'm not going to take too much time to talk about Meth House, but with this came up one of the one of the meetings a while back that's because. Okay. There are a large number of meth houses in Oklahoma and all over, all over the U.S. actually. And there's a national registry, I think it talks about it on here. If you buy a property at, a, at one of these auctions, you might be buying a meth house because, you know, you can't get in them. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, and, and just be aware that if you buy one, you're looking at a major rehab in most cases. And in the early days, they made you take it down to the studs. Now you can leave the sheetrock in place and treat in place, but all the flooring has to go, all the fixtures, every, it's pretty much a complete. Okay. But some of us, that's what we do anyway. <laughs> right? <laughs> do you ever buy a mess house? <laughs> no, not yet, thank God. Can you smell that? Yes. What does it smell and, like? Um, Acid? I've heard. <laughs> it's a pungent urine icky smell. Urine. <laughs> They kind of smell. <coughs> the chemicals they use, That's a lot of it's like acetone, fingernail There's polish. stuff you can buy, just regular household products that you can buy that, that they make meth with. Wow. Okay. And it permeates everything. And if they have mm -hmm. central heat in the air, it goes all through the house, it gets in the ductwork. Oh, wow. And I, when I was looking at this closely and, and, and taking actual classes on this, people raise children in these meth houses. And they lock them in the bedrooms, and all this heat and air, it's, it's everywhere. It, it, I don't, I just don't see anybody could do that. But this is a little deal that you can read on your own. The kind of there is tells a website you, where you can check it? It was on here. There is a national registry. It's, I think it's called clandestine houses or something. Like that. You can find it easily by just... How soon do they get on there? Well, they may not be on there. Just because you check it's not on there doesn't mean you have a clean house. It just said they haven't discovered oh, it yet. National Clandestine <laughs> Laboratory. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Jackie, so I, I tested a house the other day to, to see if it was contaminated with meth. I'm a home inspector. And um, so I, I got this purification and everything. All right. But, There's um, your answer. <laughs> Tester right there. <laughs> but anyway, um, it can also have like a sort of a burnt popcorn smell. If they're if all they're doing is smoking in the house, but if they if they actually cooked in the house, it would have a urinary smell. Well, sometime one uh, property, they just cooked it in the garage, detached garage, but they were had it in the house, smoking and doing whatever, so it was still contaminated in the house. Okay, now we're going to go on to my next handout, which is the 1031 tax deferred exchanges. I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is this is my creation from studying this a lot and from teaching it a lot. It gives you a lot of caveats. And you're, are you an accountant? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did, did you did you look through this? Yeah. Is there anything you would like to correct on it? Um. No. I mean, it's just, just I just do the actual tax filing for it when it, when okay. it occurs. But. Okay. The main thing you guys need to know is if you're going to do this. You need to let everybody know up front, right now, before you start it off, before you list the property, before you do anything. You need to tell your realtor, you need to tell your title company, tell your lawyer, and you need to engage a qualified intermediary. Um, there's all kinds of 
stuff you have to in timelines. Have you done 1031? Mm -mm. Who has? And how was your was your experience good? It was. Did you use the QI? Qualified intermediary? Yes, we did. We did that and, and then we have what 45 days to identify. That means have under contract. Mm -hmm. And then 180 days to close, is that right? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. all the timelines are on here, yeah. but they're this they're says pretty 135, but it's 130. Okay. Where's this I want? Four. Six. All together. 180. And then if something busts during that timeline, you lose that. I think that the a point I was making is that 180 days includes the 45. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, this I think this is a good little cheat sheet if you're going to do one. Um, well, some people ask me, what, how long do I have to hold the property before I can do a 1031? And there is no IRS or any bright line test. The only thing that you need to know is you need to hold it for investment purposes only. In other words, you didn't buy it just to flip it. Um, if you keep it probably six or months or a year, nobody's going to question that. If you try to immediately, you better have a good story of why you flipped it, and you better have other properties that you have held on to longer to be convincing that, yeah, I really bought this as an investment property. I wasn't intending to, if you, if you just flip, 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 and you think you're going to do 1031, mm -hmm. they'll call you on it. Does that change if you're living in the property or? Um, I don't think you can. Uh, uh -oh. Like if it has to be investment. Does it matter if what kind well, of? Well, it has the accountant. Yeah, it has to be, it has to be investment mm -hmm. and actually new for 2018 with the tax cuts and jobs act. It has to be an identical like property. So before you could do it like an investment property, yeah. Or yeah. Okay, well, on the, on the back here, we're talking about like kind properties. Now, maybe this is outdated. It used to be like kind was it could be commercial, residential, single family, apartment complexes, vacant land, new construction. It could be a lot of things and still be considered like kind. Has that changed? Yeah, for 2018, it's changed. So, so there's something to be, to be aware of. Exactly. Now, here it says property sale for personal use, do not qualify. Mm -hmm. And the other big thing is that people think, oh, you don't have to pay the taxes. Well, it's deferred, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, eventually somebody, you, your heirs might yeah, have. Yeah, I mean, it's great if you does it plan to never sell the property because then your heirs will get it and they get a step up in basis. So it's, mm -hmm. it's never paid. Right. It's great. I just went to a 1031 deal on that lifetime deal. You didn't say it changed. There were two attorneys there, so I don't know about that. Anyway, the, the, by retaining more of the of the capital or your your profit, you're able to invest in a bigger, better property. It's kind of the idea. It kind of lets you step up your game, even though it's not tax free. It's tax deferred. So that's a couple of points I'd like to make when I talk about 1031s. And incidentally, I. I you can exempt, uh, <coughs> if you're living in the personal property within some time constraints, you can exempt the gains on that, okay. 250 per person. Right. Two, 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 five, two, five, yeah. So oh, that's probably why 1031 doesn't really apply. Right. I guess that's true. Okay, we're pretty good on our time. Okay. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is in the handouts. I think it's the white form, the single family residential contract. If you're a wholesaler, you, you, you really need to be familiar with this. If you, you know, if you're a casual buyer, you might, maybe you buy from wholesalers. You need to be just familiar with a one-page contract. I know it's tempting to use the state's contract, but it's six pages, and most of it applies to realtors. Mm -hmm. So unless you are on the MLS or buying from the MLS, and actually, even if you're a realtor, you don't have to use the state's contract. It's just there. It's already done. It's already approved. But I like the one page if I'm dealing with individuals mm -hmm. because they feel more comfortable with this paperwork, right? We don't ever say the word contract. <laughs> it's the paperwork. They say, let's get the paperwork out of the way. And a few points about the contract. And I've got these little, in the pink there, the parties. The parties have to be individuals with the ability to contract. In other words, please don't get a wholesale deal with somebody that's dementia or, you know, Alzheimer's or even if they're high on drugs, alcohol, <laughs> things like that, that's not a good contract. And the other thing is you cannot deal with minors. If some kid's 17 and you did a contract with him, get, what's the status of it? Void. Invalid. Void. No. No. You don't get the book. 
<laughs> no, it's revocable yes. at the request of the minor only. That's right. She's right. She gets a book. Dang it. <laughs> Where did you learn that? Uh, you told me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought it was the correct answer. It's voidable. At, it's voidable at the option of the minor. <laughs> and they'll, uh, as I understand the law, and once they turn 18, it ripens into a good contract. So if they're 17 or close, it's probably you're probably not right. But I did. A so you can't close on it before they're 18, or you can, but you if can, they back but up, you, no you probably could undo the deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I have. I, I had one. Have you know what? <laughs> right. It's a good idea. Don't don't give property to minors right. because this one guy gave his property to. Uh, well, he did it to him and his son. And the kid was like 15. Then they decided they really, really wanted to sell it. Mm -hmm. So then they had to go to court, get a guardianship, uh, have a hearing. That was my house, yeah. So that see, was, it, it causes trouble, right? It was the 12, right? it was the 12 year old, yeah. Did, what happened with it? I don't know. <laughs> I told him, I'm like, well, we can't do it. He didn't want to do the, uh, I got him in touch with Danny. He was like, no, I don't want to spend the money. And I'm like, okay. See, so but you just know up front, you mm -hmm. got to have parties with the ability to contract. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a legal objective. You can't contract to sell, you know, marijuana. And, <laughs> Some states. <laughs> the legal description, no, I think we touched on that before, has to be absolutely dead on correct. And the address, they must match. The purchase price, of course, that's what they call consideration. That has to be in there, correct? Well, first, the overriding thing is contracts dealing with real property must be in writing, according to Oklahoma and uh, the statutes that say have to be in writing, so here we are. Okay. Purchase price has to be in there. Now, look to your right, you see where this is the word earnest money? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You notice it's not in pink? Mm -hmm. Can anyone tell me why that's not in pink? Not is it element? You don't have to have it, do you? You don't have to have it. Have well, it. Why do we put it in <coughs> contracts for to real estate? To, to, to make the contract valid, but you don't necessarily have to have a certain amount. You can have whatever they'll agree to. You can do it for a dollar if they would agree to it. Is it, is it ten dollars a minimum in the state of Oklahoma, or no. is it something there? Like if you, in order for if it to you be put it in there, it needs to be adequate. Nobody knows what really adequate means. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be in there. It's basically in there because property is like the biggest purchase: mm -hmm. hundred thousand, two hundred, oh, could be a million. Right. We want to know if we take it off the market for months. Mm -hmm. You'd better be serious. In fact, you better be so serious that you put up ten dollars. Oh, damn, you're serious. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't like Jose Lurs that just put up a ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Like really? <laughs> Are you really gonna close on it and lose your ten dollars? <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to stress that point because some people think that you have to have that in there. Uh, if you do put it in there, here's my caveat. If you do put it in there, you better tender it to the title company. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody wants to wiggle out of it and you haven't tendered it to the title company, they're going to say, oh, you didn't perform. You didn't do it. So if it's in there, do it. And if it's in there, it needs to be adequate. I'd say at least $100. I mean, why are you going to lose $100? You're not going to lose much. It's like a speeding ticket. Right. If speeding tickets to 10 bucks, you speed all the time. If, you know, <laughs> if it's 300, you're saying, oh, I better slow down. And, and like I said, you better tender to the title company. Don't ever give earnest money to the seller. Because you, you, that, you will never see it again if it's $1,000 <laughs> or, you know. You need to put your closing date. It's either a date certain or it could be hinged on signing. It could be hinged on when the probate's done. be hinged on when the quiet title's done. Hmm. But you have to anchor that date down. Then pretty much if from there down, everything is um, negotiable. Who pays what? It's always negotiable. There are standards in the industry, but it's whatever. If you're negotiating with a seller and you're very close, okay, well, I'll pay all the closing costs. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's split, but you can say, well, okay, to get the deal done, I'll sweeten it by saying the closing costs. But all these things are, and that's why I encourage you to write your own or make it to where it, it, it's flexible enough that it can reflect what you agreed to with that seller. Mm -hmm. And almost, almost always taxes are prorated, but I've done them with people that are three years behind, and I've agreed to pay, pay that because it was that good of a deal. And uh, if you're a realtor, you need to disclose it in there. So in my, in my version, 
I have some language in there about I'm a realtor, but I'm not representing you, and we're not taking a commission. Nobody's getting a commission out of this deal. And of course, if you are a realtor, you are by law required to tell them and in your marketing. So that's why some of you say, should I get a, a license? Well, there might be an upside. There might be a downside in that you have to tell everybody in your marketing materials that you're a realtor and you're with X broker and this is our phone number. So in my marketing, I have to put that in there because I do a mail outs. I have to disclose all that. I don't have to tell my attorney all the enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any questions about this? Yes, is, this so the, is this the one that you use yourself? Yeah, except I had the real right in there, integrated in there, I had about being a realtor. So sometimes these things change after you get them to sign on the line. It's like there's a delay, or you find out something's worse in the house, and you say, well, you take 5000 less, or so. What do you do then? Just You can go back. You can always go back and negoti renegotiate. But do you, this is the contract, so you write up an addendum and then have that signed? Yes, you can do that. You can agree to a new closing date if there's something. And sometimes you can just put right in there that if it turns out that it needs to be a probated or a quiet title or whatever, then, then the parties in that event, the parties agree to extend until that's accomplished or something like that. But that's the basics of, uh, of course, you need to sign it. The parties need to sign it. And in regards to if you negotiate a new price, then you would just go out there, scratch out the old price and both you of you can do that or you just do an addendum. Just do a new one. Okay. The one on the back, is that for the wholesaling? Oh, that was glad you mentioned that. If you are a wholesaler, you get a, a property under contract at a great price, and you know you can t pass it on to an investor for what? What's the typical markup? What's the typical five, assignment fee? About five-ish. I thought you'd say ten. <laughs> five. It could be three thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, ten thousand to twelve would be a great home run, right? Mm -hmm. Andrew done a lot of them. <laughs> what's the worst? What's the worst you've done on a, a five hundred? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you believe tell us your best. <laughs> Seventeen. Nice. So see, when you get a, a property under contract for a good price, that this is can be very valuable. You can sell this. And we all, we all, I've done tons of them. Andrew's done tons of them. So this piece of paper could be worth a lot of money to you. Do the assignment. And then, oh, the, the, this is what I wanted to be sure and point this out. See the pink, the pink lettering? This assignment is not further assignable without the express written consent of the Asinor. That means they can't take your wholesale deal and try to wholesale it, because I've seen that happen. Mm -hmm. Somebody tries to sell your wholesale deal. They might even put it on Zillow. They might shoot it out like it's theirs. And then if they snag somebody, then they try to, no, that, that will prevent them from doing that. So let's skip over and talk about because I want I want to sure get this in. See the handy little booklets that I got for you guys? Because mm -hmm. I know none of you know anything about probate because I've seen over and over people think if you have a will you don't have to probate, right? I get, no. If you have a will or you don't have a will the estate has to go through probate unless the transfer on death deed. Oh, Blaine, you get a book for that. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> There's or you have a trust set up. There you go. And, and what's, what's the other way? There's a third way we can avoid probate. Yeah. We've already talked about it. Okay. Joint tenancy. <laughs> so unless you've done those things, and usually, even if you've done that, there's other property that will have to go through probate, the cars, or there could be well, you know, you money and accounts, the there could be insurance, there, there could be all kinds of things that don't make it into the trust, or they don't come under this, they don't, if they're not subject to the transfer on death deed. So anyway, the point is, with, with or without a will, it needs to go through probate. Why? Because the, the, that will might not be valid. It might not be the last will. Mm -hmm. It might not be. It, the, it might not be the original. Mm -hmm. People try to pro probate copies, mm -hmm. and you know what? The judge is going to say, uh, "This is a copy," and I believe the person may have torn up the original because they didn't want that to happen with right. their estate any longer. So those copies are probably not going to be valid. And then the judge has to say, "Well, 
here's how it could happen. I've seen this before where a will, the person who is taking under the will also witnessed it. Mm. And that's a no-no. And then the, also I've seen wills, I've seen power of attorneys that later turned out were forged. So that's why they need to be proven in the court with the judge. So everything's on the up and up. If you just have a piece of paper that's the will, I mean, don't, don't buy from somebody that says that, it, it, just know that it, it's going to go through probate. Now, the good thing is, if it's just a house, we can take it through probate, in most cases, in 45 to 60 days, at a cost of between 1500 to 2500 depending on how many heirs right. and how much work it's going to be. And if it's contested, it can take longer. But this is a good little book because you get an overview of everything. Now, this is gold right there because if you find a house that needs to go through probate, this tells you the conversation that you need to have with the sellers that think they're the heirs. <laughs> they probably are, but they're probably, I've done one of those things I had 20 heirs. It was kind of cumbersome because we couldn't find some of them. But this, this tells you the questions to ask. If they have a death certificate, all these specific dates that you need to get, who's going to act as the executor. Sometimes they die with it. Is there a will? Is there not a will? There's all these things hey, Jackie, that will really expedite things if you know them. If a will ha was filed at the county court clerk's office, does that take precedent over any subsequent will, even if it's been notarized nope. and all that? Nope. It does. There's no requirement the wills be filed at all. Most people just leave them with their attorney or they stick them in a drawer, tell the heirs, you know, when I die, it's in that chest of drawers. Or Beautiful. Yeah, it's just because <laughs> that, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make it easier to, to find in some cases. I've seen in the bar journal at the back, it'll say, does anybody have, did, did any attorney out there draw up a will for this person? Because we're all looking, we, we, we're pretty sure they had one, can't find it. You know, I don't know if they ever nest the real thing or not. You try, yeah, you need to know some of their, the debts of that person. Did they have a mortgage, line of credit, credit cards, things like that. Hopefully they'll have the abstract of the property. But that's kind of some of the stuff you need to know about probate. So if they don't know where the abstract is, can you contact um, title companies and say, hey, do you always have this stored in your... You know what? They are a lot better lately about being able to come up with abstracts. So I think they kind of have it. I don't think it's a, a formal clearinghouse. But I think there's, they do have some way to communicate and find those. Okay. Yeah, it's been great. I know I've, I thought some were hopeless, and they come up with it like, wow. I got a question on, on the probate. Well, I guess it's technically in regards to a living trust and whatnot. Now, you as an individual cannot set up a living trust, right? Like an attorney or somebody has to do it? or. Oh, uh, I mean, you could do it. But it's, um, most of the time people would get an attorney to do it. Because you have to find, you have to create them, and then you have to fund them. Mm. Okay. Okay, a few more minutes. In your packets, there's because we are landlords. These handy little handouts came from the Oklahoma Bar Association, and. Even when I was reading, I'm like, oh, yeah, some, some good stuff in these. If, if you ever tried to do your own eviction, <laughs> it's good stuff in here. Has anybody <laughs> here done their own eviction? And how, what was your experience? Mine, Mine turned out okay. I, it was before, years ago, before I was a real investor. I was just someone taking over the right house, but it, I got a judgment. And I got an order to get them out. Good. So, do you do your own? Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you had any problems? Only when they show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They don't always show up. No. Sure. They don't ever, hardly. Uh, I've had to. And did, were you still successful? Um, one, yes. And the other one I can't can't remember exactly what happened, but 
and we had we had to go outside and talk and you know I they owed me rent so they gave up I think yeah they if they owe you rent the judge has no problem deeming you ju judgment okay. and then, and then the bigger question is can you collect it uh, <laughs> I know you some people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> call, call Guido. It's, a, it's just a new service. Yeah. If, if they ever get a conscience. <laughs> I had an experience with a, um, a tenant, and we went to um, look at the house because we haven't heard from them or anything. And um, my dad had to pull me up through the window because everything was trashed. Mm -hmm. Everything was just trashed. It was very emotional for me because I was kind of younger. Um, but then I was going to college at the time and the son of the tenant went to the same school and he couldn't even look at me in the face. And I got to the point where I'm like, yo, what happened? Like, y'all left the house trash, you know, what happened to the out of pocket for all of this? And um, a month later, I think his mom went to my mom's job and dropped off like two checks. Like a month and a month, like wow. 300 and then 200. It wasn't <laughs> enough to like fix everything, but the fact that I mean, I that talk that I had with the son, it made him like, yo, we messed up. So that's not typical, usually, you're not going to get those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and if you do get judgment, you take it to an attorney to collect, they're going to get what 30 to 50 percent. Mm -hmm. Better, better than zero mm -hmm. if you get you know judgment. I find that if, if you know they're there, you can just say, if you don't come out of the house, I'm going to pour gasoline on your car and burn it. <laughs> That's horrible. Don't do that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> As an attorney, you should advise them against that. <laughs> Uh-oh, he's saving. <laughs> yeah, he said it, not her. <laughs> Andrew, have you done your any evictions? I've done a few. And have yeah, I usually have somebody start the process and then we go to court. Most of the times they don't show up at court, but usually we can go out in the hallway and work it out. <coughs> I've only had uh, uh, the worst case is that one I gave you the other day, a friend of mine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was inter that's been interesting. Uh, but uh, most of the time, I mean, I, I just don't have a problem with them. Usually they don't show up. Ninety, probably ninety percent of the time, I just sit there and have to go through the, you know, stand up and they're not here, no big deal. So. Like it, yeah. That's that's about eighty percent probably. They don't show up. So anybody have any, any questions about any? So when so when they don't show up, you have a judgment. You're probably not going to get the money, but you just take this piece of paper with the police and make them get out, take mm -hmm. their stuff, and move out while you're standing there. Well, you, know, you have to give you them forty eight hours. You have to give the paper to the put in the stack, and then they call you like twenty four forty eight hours. You're at their disposal whenever they want to call and go over there and do it. Like the sheriff or the <coughs> the sheriff. Yeah, the well, sheriff is whenever they. The feel sheriff's like writ. Yeah, once you get possession, you got to go post a forty-eight hour notice. Then they have forty-eight hours to get out before you file a writ of assistance. If I'm not incorrect, I think that's right. And, mm -hmm. and then the writ of assistance is, you know, asking the sheriff to come out. Yeah, I don't uh, do evictions because I don't like getting shot at. But <laughs> that's just, that's just me. <laughs> the only time I've had to use the sheriff is. Uh, this guy that kept postponing it because he didn't have any money because he was doing lousy work. He's a construction guy in my house. I will never Tenet. probably have one. Yes. Tenet. And so that's the only time I had to use a sheriff. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I just leave. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got one more handout before we have enough time here. Are any of you landlords also Airbnb hosts? Not yet. Really? Really? Just me? I have extra, extra, not extra work. <laughs> I, have, I have two, and I'm maybe adding a third. You like it? Uh, well, it, you net so much more money. It's mm. more trouble. It's kind of a trade off. It's more trouble and hassle, but you make a lot more money. Mm. If you get two Airbnbs, it's like having a third rental. And really, the only extra cost is furnishing the unit. Wow. But you know, you have to be in a good location. Mm -hmm. Has to be really nice, really clean. Everything's you know, real well stocked. And you can charge extra for witness protection. Yeah, we have that too. Wow. <laughs> what? And this is this is oh, actually four four, four parts. <laughs> one, two, three. There's actually four so parts good. to it. Yeah. That's a joke. 
I like to <laughs> talk about the first page because it tells you the right on there that there's good stuff, there's the bad stuff about Airbnb. I've just heard um, there was an article a couple of days ago about this couple that had a really bad experience in the Airbnb and they said never again, but most people, ha most of the time the people that I host were guests. I've had a very positive experience, only a couple of uh, kind of tore the place up. One of them, they, they left a lot of stains on the carpets because they had a party. So one thing I've learned, not, it's not on the sheet, but uh, don't let local people stay one night because <laughs> they're just renting your house to trash it out and have a party that's why they're if they're from Edmond Oklahoma City more they want to rent your house for one night on Halloween <laughs> so now I block some, I block some of the party nights and I tell them they have to do two night minimum so if, if they're it kind of they, they'll just go somewhere else so they can get for one night they don't so want to pay for two nights. Say locals to my minimum. Locals, no, not not. Or you do everybody. Oh, and these people, uh, they wanted to come in. They wanted to see the house. Not that if they want to see it first, they're local. So I'm like, well, okay, well it's vacant this day and this day. And I said, by the way, why do you why are you wanting to uh, rent it if you if you live right around here? Oh, well, we're gonna have a birthday party, and uh, mm -hmm. it says right on my deal. I don't allow parties. Oh, well, okay, let's see. They, was, they just were going to trash my house instead of their house. Wow. Mm. Yeah. But here, they're all, you know, the Airbnb is great because they, they collect the money. They put it right into your bank account. They collect and pay the hotel tax. They advertise it on the Internet. All you, you, know, you have to provide them the information, mm -hmm. great pictures, great descriptions, all the amenities and so forth. But... They do all, the, uh, you know, pu pushing it out there. Now, if you do really good, like me, you'll, be, <laughs> you'll have a um, super host badge and a frequent traveler badge so that your listing will flow up to the top because you're so good. If you have really good five-star ratings, mm -hmm. so that makes your your listing come up to the top faster. I got I What's the average you can charge per night? Nice. God, so it so varies. So and if you get closer to the to sale and down there, mm -hmm. oh man, you can charge great. I think that's the best place to have one because you can outstrip your normal rental rates like a lot, mm -hmm. two or three times. Yeah, I'm in. I've got one in the village, like ninety and one in Quilla Creek. More than that. And I don't think they have quite the demand down there. But then mm -hmm. I don't have much competition up there. Mm. Have you ever rented to nurses? Mm -hmm. Nurses, doctors. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. And people, people who just got a boob job and they want to, re you know, they have to go back the next day and get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they tell us all. They tell me all this stuff. Well, I'm here because you know, have well, a facelift and. Do they rent it for three months? Like, come. Yeah, I've had the longest. I think is a little over a month. Okay, so they're traveling nurses. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, yeah, That's there's a lot, of, like. a lot of medical people because I'm very near, close enough to Baptist, close enough yes. to Mercy. Yeah. Hmm. With my units, but a lot of people recovering from surgery. We'll stay there. Uh, it could be uh, weddings, uh, funerals. Mm -hmm. Could just become the visit. Stuff like that. So there's all kinds of reasons out there. All kinds of demand. Is it uh, possible for you to Airbnb a property to like a hospital or surgery center? What you should do is go to their, their human resources mm -hmm. and talk to them and see how often they need long term. Like you should go to like Tinker. Okay. Talk to their people. They, they probably need to bring in people for training a lot. They right. may need to stay extended, like yeah. a month to six months for training. Okay. So that okay. would be good. Definitely. I'll have to look yeah. into that. Get people there. And they, you know, they don't care because their employer's paying them. For exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're probably going to be professionals. Hopefully, they will take care of them. You know, right. So that's, that, that, there's all these pros and cons, and you can read them on your own. There's all kinds of little, the bottom little ideas of how you can kind of do some extra stuff for your, your guests. This second one is just a sample guest letter. They encourage you to have a guest letter. This can be on your site. It can also be in the unit in the cons conspicuous place. So your guests need to know all this stuff about the amenities, supplies, where everything is. Um, you need to have um, tell them where the first aid kit is, or how to, everything works. Checking in, checking out, 
give me your phone number, your email, because you need to be, you need to be somebody that's very accessible, because things happen. Um, now I have one of these keypad things where people can let themselves in and out, and I've learned that you better put a hide the key somewhere because that battery's going to go down, and then they can't get in. Uh -huh. And if you don't want to make a midnight run across town, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I've asked me how I know, <laughs> that's, that's Andrew line. <laughs> Yeah, I know. So you need to have a hide key somewhere. So when that happens, because those batteries go down, there's no beep beep or no warning. You know, there's wow. it happens. But it's great to have your unit where they can just check in, and check out, and you never have to see them. It's, I don't want to interact with these people because I don't have time. But if I was fully retired, I might want to interact with them more. Right. And some people have Airbnb right in their home because they're retired. They want to meet people from all over the world. They want to have dinner with them and wine and get to know them. But I just don't have time. Mm -hmm. So these people, they can go in and out. I never actually have to meet them. And if they, do you remember last, last winter when it was like mega icy and snowy and nobody wanted to get out? Okay, at the time I was living way across town from my Airbnb. These people called me and they wanted me to bring them a roll of toilet paper. And they were like right there by the Walmart. They could have walked to the 7 Eleven or Walmart. And they actually wanted to go like all the way across town to bring them one roll of toilet paper. I know it's kind of an emergency, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, can't you get it yours? Like right there. <laughs> so this is a good little kind of a go by for what you can create. So I didn't have all this stuff when I did my Airbnb, so this is kind of a result of what I've been reading and from my personal experience from doing two years of Airbnb mm. and there's still a lot I don't know about it because this is a really a powerful deal. I mean, they can really do a lot. Mm. Then the considerations, it tells you on there uh, what what are your options, some of your options. That you, and there's tons of options. There's a lot of forms and there's a lot of possibilities for what you can tailor it to what you want. Mm. You do have to have fantastic pictures and a creative description of your property. And then, uh, and Lucas can help you get oh, yeah. a bird's eye view mm -hmm. as if you're walking around the unit and you can upload that to your Airbnb. And I, I've always heard anytime you have that or even a video walkthrough, you're going to really up your uh, amount of your bookings. Thank you. I think from what I've heard, the review deal with the super host is a huge deal too and I've talked to some people that get like one bad review or something like that and it knocks them down so far yeah as far like as do you live and die by those reviews right it's very important and that's why I guess a lot of entry Airbnb people are charging less you know really pampering everyone because they try to bump their five-star reviews I know as in, quick in as the possible. beginning I was under market so I could get people right. in and I could get the reviews yeah. and I've always been just really really crazy about clean 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 everything has to be clean yeah I have a lot I I put umbrellas in them I put games I put robes I try to think of everything a traveler yeah. you know, would want and they might not because robes are big and bulky you don't want to put that in your suitcase yeah. so I have robes hanging in there and uh, I just try to make it very homey I try to have a pretty well stocked kitchen now I will say that it got really old putting the the breakfast stuff in there, because I noticed that most of the time they wouldn't eat it or drink. I, I don't know why. Yeah. So I didn't take it home, and I don't eat sticky buns and stuff like that, <laughs> or I don't I don't like breakfast stuff like that. I don't drink juices, so I thought I think I'm just wasting money doing this. So I took that off my listing. It hasn't hurt at all. It's yeah. not on there. There's one more thing on the back. Oh, okay. and this is another thing I didn't have early on. Is that what all do you have to put in there? And this is just what went in my condo. And it's a, a little bit different for my house because it's, it's a little bit bigger and stuff. But see uh, the detail, the stuff you have to have, in there, even mm -hmm. even clothes hangers. I, I have an ironing on one of those little ironing boards. I have washer dryer. I have to I have to have the washer pellets and the dryer sheets. All this good stuff. Yep. I have, uh, you have to have a coffee maker. I have a curry in one and a regular coffee, Mr. Coffee type thing in the other one. So do you supply the coffee as well? Yes. So approximately how much in 
upfront investment to do all this kind of stuff would you say there is? Oh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty thrifty, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I steal, beg, borrow, whatever. And I go thrift stores, I go to consign the stores, I go to Goodwills, whatever, to pull it all together and they look great. Everybody loves them. So you, you don't have to go to buy all brand new stuff. Especially when I was just doing it to see, kind of a test deal. Well, I don't want to get a lot of money and, just, and then go, oh, yeah, this isn't working at all. Mm. But you'd be surprised how many of your friends say, hey, I've got an extra this. Or, I just didn't want to throw away or give it away, but I'll let you use it. Mm. And I had tons of spare stuff for my own house because I have a big house. I had way too much stuff in there. <laughs> incredible. Just incredible how much stuff I took over and didn't even miss it. But mattresses, you probably have to buy new mattresses. That's kind of a, hmm. Uh, you, could, you could have bed bugs. I was going to ask you, <laughs> how'd you get your mattresses up? Yeah, I pretty much had to buy them. There, you, there's places, you know, mattress outlets and places you can get them. Yeah, you have to have a lot of towels because when you're washing this batch of them, you need to have some ready to go that you can just put up and then you can leave. Did you if you don't want to stand there while you do three loads of laundry. Yeah. Did you put queens or kings in the... I have uh, two queens in the house, and I have um, a full size and a king in the condo. So, but you can do whatever, kind of whatever you can find, at least mm -hmm. initially. Buying sheets, I, I, I get cheap ones. <laughs> I just go, I go to Big Lots or someplace, um, mm -hmm. Burlington, get... Now that I actually, sometimes I have to clean them, I have to put the sheets on. I know some sheets are wrinkle real bad, some of them feel great, some of them launder great, and I have no clue where I got them or how much I paid. <laughs> I'm like, wish I would have paid more attention because I want more sheets like this. Mm -hmm. Don't know where I got them. Yeah. And I put mattress pads on everything because people have accidents, try to get the kind where there doesn't go through to the mattress, mm -hmm. the mattress pad on there. And then you'll have to wash them every so often as well. But anyway, that's, that's pretty much our last hand up. So you're gonna stir around for a couple of questions, or if anybody has any burning ahead. burning questions, we yeah. can. Yeah, gonna go ahead and cut off. So we're kind of cut it off in an hour. So you're gonna stick around for a few minutes. So if you have something you just need answered, I'm sure you could talk her out of it. Uh, exactly. Thank you. Do you know a mobile notary? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my go-to guy on the <laughs> mobile notary. Shameless plugs over with. Yes, yeah, right. plug. that's it. But don't hesitate to. So to do you ever get around. your cards made up? <laughs> I have to change them because it, where it said fee schedule, I put don't worry, we'll get together, and that, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Works for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got any questions for us? Walk for up. Good to, to see everybody. Savvy radio show. Glide online and listen to our other motivating episodes at SavvyRadioShow.com. Connect on Twitter at LandlordBook and always be buying assets.